Organizations have traditionally used technology to improve business process, increase productivity, and become overall more efficient. While today's technology is cutting edge, every generation has also had their series of cutting edge technology. Keep in mind that the abacus was at one point a technological uh, evolution. The Apple I at some point led computer, the computer industry as one of the best machines. All of these at some point will, will be eliminated, will be replaced by another technology. As technology becomes readily available and more inexpensive to, to obtain, the competitive advantages that a company once had are pretty much lost. As we move into this new era of high-paced business change, technological revolution, innovation, the amount of time that organizations can enjoy this technologically based competitive advantage is reduced. One quote that I like is, the ability to learn faster than, you, than your competition is your only sustainable competitive advantage. This quote really holds true. Because advantages are short-lived, businesses today have to be able to continuously innovate. They cannot stay standstill. They cannot simply react. They have to be more proactive. Such continuous innovation requires a culture of learning, of adaptation, of being creative. When this is achieved, then the competitive advantage is less about the technology itself and more about the organization, more about the culture, more about the innovation process. If you have not yet done so, please check out the video titled Did You Know? A hyperlink is, is seen on, on the screen. It provides facts and, and statistics that um, illustrate the importance of ad adaptability and innovation in a society where technology and change are central themes, are necessities in doing business. Information technology is all around us. It influences the way we live our lives and conduct business. In today's environment, especially here in the U.S., it's difficult, if not impossible, to find an organization that can achieve sustainability and profitability without using any technology at all. The use of IT is felt in practically every aspect of every business, whether it's in procurement, logistics, customer service, etc. For organizations to remain competitive, they have to be able to continuously innovate. Innovations lead to competitive advantages, and continuous innovation can lead to sustainability. And such sustainability is achieved only is only as strong lived really as the innovation itself. Think about uh, I like to use Apple as an example. Today, Apple's iPad is not the competitive advantage that it was when it was first released. Same thing with the iPhone. Same thing with the with the iPod. Each of these innovations had its time, had its moment, but as competition catches up, the competitive edge is, is um, the competitive gap is usually closed and shortened. Also, organizations have to focus on developing a culture of information changing, idea sharing that sparks these, uh, these creative fires that need, to be, that need to fuel innovation. Apple's competitive advantage was really more about this creative uh, organization, this creative culture that generated these products. It wasn't really the product itself. How they did things allowed them to be competitive. Now, each company is different. The way that Apple chose to do it is one way, but other companies choose to do it another way. Think of it this way. Let's say you're in a room full of your peers, be it school, work, or, or whatever, and your boss or professor asks you to provide an idea on any topic. You share the idea only to be ridiculed. What do you think the probability is that you will ever share an idea again? The thing is, your peers also see this. They saw how ridiculed you, you were. So what do you think? Do you really honestly believe that anybody else would contribute an idea after somebody was ridiculed? Probability is no. Therefore, in order to generate this culture of innovation, we must be able to, to adapt, to listen, to share ideas. In order to be competitive in today's society, 
we have to learn how to create this culture of information sharing and collaborate. And this starts by creating the environment that makes brainstorming without retributions a, an example, that makes it a, an ability, that makes it possible to do all these. Now, although technology can provide many benefits, using technology for just the sake of having it or implementing it doesn't really guarantee any results. In order for positive results to be achieved, technological strategy has to align with overall organizational goals and overall organizational strategy. If the technology is conflicted with organizational strategy, failure is almost inevitable. Think of it this way. Let's say I have a X type of company and I want to invest in, in a social media. I want to be able to market in social media. And therefore, I put a lot of money and a lot of effort into developing a social media campaign. However, within my organizational structure, within the policies set forth, I have a policy that completely contradicts the social media, the social media marketing part, which is employees are not allowed to use Facebook during, organ uh, during company time. This right there is a conflict, and it will not allow for, for uh, the, the right strategy to be incorporated and the right marketing plan to be, to be set forth for the social media experiment. Therefore, an alignment is almost necessary in order for a successful outcome to be achieved. Technology only supports organizational strategy. Therefore, if alignment isn't achieved, the support structure really isn't there. How many times have we seen organizations invest hundreds, thousands, even millions of dollars in technology only to see it fail? This is actually very common in the business world. Most of it, most of the time, it has little to nothing to do with the organization, with the, I'm sorry, with the technology itself. And mostly it has to do with the alignment of that technology with the organizational strategy. For example, let's say that I need to, to, to adopt and invest in an inventory control system to manage inventory for my store. However, I haven't thought of a business strategy that deals with the reception process, meaning I haven't taught employees how to receive the product, how to place the product, how to count the product, and how to shelve the product correctly. No matter what type of technology I invest in, no matter what I incorporate it, no matter what I incorporate, no matter how good the technology itself is, this will ultimately lead to failure because there is no human element and there is no organizational element to be able to, to manage the technology itself. Meaning, when a box comes in, instead of a box being placed in a particular location that will then be counted, that will then be entered into the system, that will then be updated, it simply is maybe discarded by one person, placed in another place by another person, and there is no flow, there is no chain of events. So any technology that you incorporate into that will have ultimately no effect on the process itself. The generation of information is sparked exclusively by an event. Now, this is true in the 1600s as it's true today. The dissemination of information generated by the event is what changes, meaning back then, an event generated information and word of mouth usually disseminated it. The amount of time that it took to reach a particular person would vary depending on the distances. If in another continent, then it could be years or decades before that person heard about the event. If you viewed the, uh, the video the, that I, I hyperlinked before, the, uh, the Did You Know? One of the statistics indicated that the amount of information published in a New York Times, in the New York Times today, for example, was more than, than uh, a person living in the, in the 1800s would, would uh, come across during the, their entire lifespan. Therefore, imagine the amount of information that is generated today as opposed to back then. Today, our communication and transportation infrastructure makes the dissem dissemination of information almost in instantaneous. Think about this in terms of the dangers of diseases. Because of the ease of international uh, travel, 
It's pretty much easy, easy to carry a disease such as H1N1 across any border. This is because globalization of the society created an ease of travel and a ease of communication. Not all of it is negative, though. Information can travel even faster than an infectious disease. Events that occurred interna internationally generate information that travels in, in the terms of milliseconds over the internet. This creates a need to learn how to evaluate, discard, use, and store information in order to really be able to make decisions based upon that information. Decision making then begin, begins to become more of an art. How do organizations make a decision based on the volume of information that are being generated at any one moment? This is where uh, proactivity becomes so important. Learning to view the market and adjust accordingly is now a new skill that defines those that are considered to be visionaries. Bill Gates, for example, is cons was, well, really still is considered to be a visionary. What made him a visionary? In reality, it was the ability for him to see where the market was going and adjust Microsoft and position his company in order, for, in order to be in a better position for that change, uh, when that change occurred. The easier it is for a person to view the market and the quicker the, that the person is able to make the adjustment, the more proactive that that person actually is. Those that sit and wait end up being taken over and end up losing. Countless companies fall victim to this. Remember Polaroid cameras? Kodak at one point in time was the top leading edge company in, in, um, in photography. As the market shifted to digital photography, Kodak never really, met, never really made that adjustment needed and instead was very reactive. They, they reacted years later and created their own digital camera. But by the time they reacted, they had pretty much lost the, their position as market leaders. In the business world, functional units pretty much generate the information. An organization's productivity greatly depends on how each functional unit disseminates or uses the information not only that they generate, but that is generated from other functional units. And this is mainly because of the context and visibility that's achieved by having the most amount of context at any particular time. It's not only about having context at any time, but having context context at the time that the decision is being made, meaning at the right time. For example, if the marketing department does not have statistical information about a product's sales history, then it has a narrow view of that product. It does not have all the information needed. Same can be said about pretty much any department. Having an organization with an us versus them mentality at a department level is unbelievably counterproductive in today's collaborative environment. The reason is, information from each unit provides a complete context. And if there's an us versus them mentality, then really it's each, each department is at war with one another. Instead of the organization acting as one functional unit, as one organization, as one vision, as one mission, you have maybe 10 or 12 different, um, different mini organizations working against each other. So how, how is, is one company supposed to compete against another company when there's war within? This is the same in pretty much anything, whether it be team sports, whether it be a country at war. If the country at war is in war within itself, if the team is, is bickering and fighting within itself, then that team itself is weak. That team itself will not be able to compete against any other team. They have lost before the, the game or the fight has even started. This graphic illustrates the base, the, the benefit that each functional unit can derive from the use of IT. Think about and reflect on, on why customer service would be at the top of the list. Upon reflection, you'll notice that customer service really is the one department that consistently deals with the customer, and the customer is always going to be the most important asset to any company. When I've given in, in international conferences, and I can remember one in particular, 
I was really confronted about this, about uh, what I just stated, that the customer is the most important asset to the company. And I had one gentleman stand up and just was really upset saying that I was completely wrong, that the employees were the most in, important asset because without the employees, the company couldn't function. And although this topic is really subjective, meaning everybody can have their own set of opinions, I really strongly believe that the customer ends up being the most important asset to the company. The reason is, without a customer, you don't have a reason for the company. Meaning, without customers, there is no need for the business. Therefore, the customer has to be the most important asset to the company. So, any improvement, any innovation, anything that will make the customer happy, anything that will fit the customer's needs, anything that will progress, the, what the customer wants, will ultimately have a direct impact positive impact on the company if done correctly. So information as an asset. If the customer is the most important asset, then data becomes the currency. Data has to be treated as a currency and has to be evaluated and protected as such. Same way you would protect a hundred dollar bill, same way that you protect data. You, put, you you count them, you protect them, you secure them, you make sure that, that, uh, that everything is, is, is uh, in place so that the currency is not lost. Now, there are different levels of data. Data itself are raw facts. This would be the raw entries seen in databases, Excel spreadsheets, or any, any format. No real context, just data. Information is data that's converted into some sort of meaningful, meaningful form, such as inventory reports, sales reports, etc. I mean, they have context, but they don't necessarily provide new knowledge. They, they just give you the context of the previous level, which was the data. Knowledge, now, knowledge is, is the analysis of information for the production of new intelligence that can be used in the decision-making process. This is what all businesses need to strive for. Organizations that are leaders in their industry are also leaders in the way that they manage the knowledge assets. Walmart is a perfect example of this. Walmart invests millions of dollars in their information systems. However, they don't do so just for the sake of efficiency or productivity like many companies do, and it's correct to do so, by the way. But they take all of this one step further. They invest in data warehousing and data mining techniques that allow them to really understand and contextualize the stored data. They create new knowledge and generate wisdom by developing actionable solutions. For example, they understand that beer and diapers sell better on a late Friday afternoon than any other day. Therefore, they create sales strategies around a father going to take care of their kids on the weekend because mom wants to go out with the girlfriends on the previous day. This is what makes Walmart an industry leader. They understand the importance of their data, they invest in the development of knowledge, and they also act upon that new knowledge. So here you can take a look at data. It has no real context. Without context, it's really difficult to read and act upon. Although it's very valuable, it's not very actionable, at least not yet. Here you see a little bit more context. This is information that begins to provide the context. With this information, analysis can be performed. I can begin to create that element that will make my organization successful. Most organizations will end up getting stuck here. They simply print the reports but don't really go through and analyze it enough as to create new knowledge. And then the ultimate, the knowledge. This is actionable information. This not only has context, but it also has an underlying theme that provides the organization with the ability to really take action. This is difficult to achieve, but can propel a business to a whole new level. So what exactly do I need for successful implementation of information technology on any business? Well here, this is a, a, a three-part solution. I really need the knowledge of knowing how to do things. I need to know and understand my business, how it operates, and how the different business units cooperate. 
Now, not only the different business units internally, but also how my business, my alliance partners, meaning the horizontal alignments, how these uh, collaborate with my organization. I also need to know my customer. I need to know my employees. I need to know my product. I need to know my vendors. I need to know what my weaknesses are and what my strengths are. All of this knowledge has nothing to do with technology. All of this has an, has an underlying understanding of my organization itself. Once I have that knowledge, I also need to know how to integrate technology to automate some processes, how to improve others, how to coordinate these units. I need to be able to share information. All of this technology will provide the foundation for my business. Remember, technology is not my business. Technology is a tool that I use to run my business more efficiently. If I have an efficient process and I put a technology on top of it, then that, that'll be successful. And I also need people. I need to create a culture that can use this technology, share the information, and understand the business side. All of these aspects needs to be, need to be in sync. How will people use this information? How will people use the technology? After all of these aspects are in sync, then they also need to be continuous. These need to be repetitive. I need to be able to learn, apply, and share. Think about the steps needed to build a wall. If I have the equipment in place and I have the instructions or the knowledge, but I don't have the people, I probably will not be able to get it done. If I have the people in place and I have the equipment, but I do not have the instructions or, or the knowledge, then I may be able to get it done, but probably not. I need all three aspects to work in synergy in order to achieve the desired goal of building this wall. Technology is no different. Most small businesses will end up struggling with this, and the reason is that sometimes it's expensive to obtain all three. Either you have the knowledge and you have the people, but you don't have the budget for the technology or the tool. Or you may have the tool, but you do not have access to the people who possess the knowledge. Now, as the world becomes more globalized and resources are more readily available, this problem will, will continuously disappear. This, will, this is why outsourcing has become so popular. It because, it's because it provides the ability for small organizations to really focus on their core and begin to outsource other processes that used to be expensive to other places or other companies whose core, whose core competencies are the So my ultimate goal in personnel, each functional unit has its own language. Accounting is going to speak using their accounting terms. Finance will use its numbers, and IT will, be, will begin using their, all their nerdy terms. Learning how to communicate is something that all parties really have to learn how to do. Having a common language is essential for communication and understanding. If this presentation was, for example, in Spanish, then those who don't know Spanish would not be able to understand it. However, since we agreed upon a specific language, we all understand that language, and we can all communicate in English. Also, personnel need to understand what their responsibilities are, in, not only in, in terms of communication, but what their actual duties are. It should be part of the job function. In today's environment, it's not enough to simply work well. Employees have to be able to work well in teams, and this means that everybody needs to learn how to communicate and work together toward a single common goal, toward that organizational goal. As I stated in my previous, previous slides or examples, if each functional unit has their own goal and it's an us versus them mentality, then the team as a whole or the organization as a whole is not pushing toward a common goal. It's pushing to maybe seven different goals and that, that just ends up in chaos. When everybody has the same goal and everybody has the same objective, then alignment in vision and mission is achieved. This allows individuals to function as a team and creates a culture where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So how can we get everybody working effectively together? One thing that I've done in the past is cross training. There's no better way of helping somebody understand somebody else's perspective than actually making them learn that other person's job function, their job roles. In my business, sales representatives are in charge of level one technical support. It's not enough to them for them to simply sell. They actually have to understand what they're selling and they have to be able to realize that there is life after the sale. Meaning, 
years ago when we did not have this, salespeople would overpromise. They would say that the software did X, Y, and Z because it was never going to be their problem. Once they sold, they would throw this to the technical support department and then technical support would end up having to deal with the issue. However, when I started doing the cross-selling, this was greatly eliminated. Reason being, now they're also responsible for the, for the afterlife, for the after sale. Technical support consequently has to learn how to communicate with customers that are well beyond tech speak. So the same holds true for the other part. Meaning, tech support, because they can also do sales, will actually have to communicate in English and not nerdy terms. They need to actually understand how to communicate with other human beings, not just themselves. And all of this really pushed the organization to, to a different level. We were able to really get every, every um, department to understand what the other department did and work in, in synergy. Now that we have strategies in place that align our goals, and we have people to execute the strategy, how do we monitor, control, and improve? Management guru Peter Drucker famously stated that if something can't be measured, there is no way that it can be managed. Understanding how to measure something then becomes indispensable in being able to develop management strategy. Measuring success for information technology is not something that's very easy to do. For example, if I upgrade our operating system software, let's say from Windows XP to Windows 8, how do I measure the return on investment? Although some aspects of productivity could be measured, oftentimes IT projects are difficult to measure. If I invest in antivirus software, for example, how do I, re how do I calculate return on investment? Can I really say that I saved X amount of dollars by avoiding a virus? Even though I might know that I did, I can't really quantify it and measurement is about quantification. Now, just because it's difficult to do does not mean that it's impossible. Companies like GE invest billions of dollars in technology products, and they're pretty much able to estimate return on investment. The idea is that the metric needs to be designed so that the measurement can take place. Key performance indicators are, are one example of this. These measures are tied to business drivers. These require input from IT and other functional units. Most of these units can be developed internally as they may be specific to a particular organization. For example, my organization measures technical support performance by determining the amount of time that a support ticket remains unsolved. The creation of video knowledge base, for example, improved this metric um, within our performance in, in indicator. We were actually able to determine by comparing the numbers before we had the videos and after we had the videos in terms of un um, of uh, remaining opened technical support items. Efficiency metrics also exist, and these measure speed, availability, and throughput. How efficient is an IT resource? These are usually objective measures that are numeric in nature. Effectiveness measures, these measure the impact that a, that a resource would have on a particular business pro, uh, process. Did upgrading a particular piece of software reduce the amount of time that an employee takes on a particular process. These are generally more subjective and depend greatly on the context. Efficiency though can be thought of throughput, transaction speed, availability, information accuracy, web traffic, and response. Effectiveness measurements are usually usability, customer satisfaction, conversion rates, and other financial indicators. Benchmarking is more of a process than a measurement although most organizations use this as a measurement tool. The idea behind this, uh, the benchmarking, is to take some sort of initial reading and create a baseline for it. Afterwards, measurements are continuously taken and you start making adjustments to seek, to seek improvements based on the, the baseline values. What good is a highly efficient technology that isn't very effective? And the, the, the contrary, what good is a highly effective technology that is not very efficient? For example, I am using a web-based customer service portal that is always available and unbelievably fast. However, when I look for the information, not all of it, not all of it is accessible by the system. 
Therefore, the system isn't very effective. The reverse is also true. What if I have the system that has every bit of information that I can pop, or, that I can need at any point in time? Well, if the system is very slow and it crashes constantly, is it any good? So there's a direct relationship between the two. IT resources have to be both highly effective and they have to be highly efficient in order for a successful outcome. Let's go back and talk a little bit more about competitive advantages and what it is and what it isn't. A competitive advantage is a product, service, process, or procedure that the customer values and is exclusive to the organization. It is not something that the organization itself values. They must be valued by the customer, otherwise it's a core competency and not a competitive advantage. Core competencies are those things that we're good at. Competitive advantages are the advantages that the customer values, meaning the customer says, yes, I prefer this company because they have this technology or this process or whatever. The reason that these are temporary is because the marketplace is really based on parity. What this means is that when the competition learns of the, the competitive advantage, they will tend to copy the advantage and the, the advantage will no longer be unique. Technology is a perfect case. If you saw when the iPad was released, it was a competitive advantage because nobody else has it. Now everybody and their mother sells, sells pad devices. You have Samsung with theirs, you have a bunch of, of, um, of Android-based devices, Microsoft got in the, in, the, in the market with their Microsoft Surface. So the iPad is no longer the only device available and the competitive advantage begins to shrink. It begins to, to become blurred as more companies get into the, get into the... Now first mover advantages occur when a competitive advantage is created by the first organization. And this advantage is significant enough to impact the market. Typically, these are game changers. This was, for example, iTunes. This was, for example, the iPhone. This was, for example, the iPad. Although copycat products emerged, it was still very difficult at the beginning for organizations to compete against the Apple brand. Number one, since they were the first movers and since they patented their products, they had this advantage. But again, these are temporary. Organi organizations they put a lot of money into resources and research and development for the creation of new products and services that can be game changers. Now they're temporary, like I said, because at some point the competition catches up and they begin to lose market share. One way that organizations can analyze the market and look at the market is through Porter's Five Force model. Porter's Five Force model is a model that identifies and analyzes the five competitive forces that shape each and every industry. It doesn't matter which industry you're in, uh, the, the Porter, Porter's Five Force model will be able to, to, to really illustrate it. This model helps identify the strengths and weaknesses of every industry. It was developed by Michael Porter from uh, Harvard Business School in 1979 and still remains effective today. And these forces are those that determine the profitability and attractiveness of any industry. So there's these five forces, the first one being buyer power. Buyer power is high when there are many of these in the market. Commodization, for example, will lead to buyer power. When consumers cannot differentiate between products or services, and therefore is a commodity, buyer power will be high. It is low when there's only a few organizations that can offer that product or service. To, to lower a, the buyer power, organization ha, an organization has to create a competitive advantage where the product or service is more attractive to the consumer than anything else provided by the, the competitor. Gasoline, for example, is a product that is considered high in terms of buyer power. The reason is there really isn't a difference between uh, purchasing Chevron gasoline or Shell gasoline. That's why gasoline is considered a commodity. There, there, it's very difficult to differentiate the product that Shell produces versus the product that Exxon produces. Supplier power though, 
when choices are very low, supplier power is ultimately high. When um, when options are high, then supplier supplier power of, uh, sorry supplier power is pretty much low. Suppliers always want this because it provides them leverage. Think about think about electricity uh, electricity companies service companies like FPL. Really, there's only one supplier where you can where a consumer can purchase electricity from, and that's FPL. Other than that, there might be there might be solar panels and, and stuff like that, but generally most people will just go to that one supplier. Therefore, the, the, the supplier itself has all the power. The buyer doesn't have a whole lot of power. Then, threat of a substitute product or service. This part deal with, deals with supply and demand. When uh, many al alternative products exist, then the threat is pretty much high. When there are very few products that exist, then the threat is low. The threat of a substitute product or service exists when the demand is affected by the change of price of the alternate product. The more substitute products that are available in the market, the more saturation, um, the more that the, that market will have saturation. This ultimately will drive the prices down and consequently will also drive profits down. The next power is a threat of new, I'm sorry, the next force is a threat of new entrants. If it's very easy to establish a business that sells similar products or service then the threat of a new entrant is is high if it's difficult then the threat is low for example if we were to develop an e-commerce site to sell any widget that can be obtained anywhere then really the threat of new entrants is high because pretty much anybody with an e-commerce site could do it however if I was to say well let's go ahead and start a bank then we're talking about a an industry where the threat of new entrants is pretty is is pretty low, meaning the threat itself is low, and the reason is because you have banking regulations, you have a lot of licenses that you need to apply for, and you need to have the capital to do so. The amount of people that would be able to to actually get that done are few, and therefore, uh, that industry would have a low threat. And then there's rivalry among the, the existing competitors. When when a cutthroat market exists, rivalry is high, meaning there's a lot of people. When competition is low, then there's there's a, not a whole lot of rivalry among all of them. And again, these are the five forces that that shape pretty much any industry or any competition. So there are four different strategies that are that are an organization can uh, can rely on cost leadership strategy am i really going to be recognized as the cheapest this typically is is the broadest target the broadest market this is like the walmart this means that i sell particularly on price and it's high volume low margin firms that compete in this arena typically acquire a lot of cost advantages by being either very efficient or gaining access to large sources of low-cost materials, outsourcing, etc. In order to succeed using this, organizations have to have access to large sums of capital. They have to be very highly skilled in design and manufacturing, or have to be uh, very efficient in their supply chain and distribution channels. Otherwise, differentiation strategy can be used. This one consists mainly of producing products or services that have a unique set of, of characteristics that a customer will perceive to be to be as better. This differentiation produces an added value that the customer is willing to pay for. Organizations that have this strategy usually have access to research and development capital. They have highly skilled people. They have highly skilled product development teams. They have strong sales forces and understand the uniqueness and have a reputation for quality and innovation. Apple computers, when they were selling Macs, for example, or as they're selling Macs is an example of this. Apple knows that the vast majority of the market is taken by, by Microsoft and Microsoft Windows. However, they have a particular product that's expensive that, that customers are willing to pay a premium price for because it's different. And therefore, they have that market. And then there's focus strategy. And focus strategy can be broken down into two into low cost and into differentiation. 
This strategy focuses on a narrow segment of the market, this is also known as a niche, and attempts to focus on a very small piece. Focused strategy organizations often achieve customer loyalty and that makes it very difficult for other organizations to come in and compete against. These firms, however, have less supplier power because they lack volume. They don't have the same volume that, that, uh, that, that the cost leadership strategy uh, organization have. However, since their niche is so focused, there's not a whole lot of substitute products that will exist to replace the product that they, that they provide. And then there's the value chain. Once in business, each functional unit and organization that is part of a supply chain can contribute to the success or failure of that organization. A business process, which is, this is something that, that, uh, that everybody needs to know, a business process is a standardized set of activities to accomplish a specific task. Now, these are used to accomplish something very specific such as processing an order. To measure the impact of such a business process, value chain analysis can be used. Value chain is a way of viewing the entire organization either as a series or processes that can add value to a particular product or service. In order to develop a competitive advantage from the value chain, the organization has to develop customer value from the processes. These can be either internal to the organization or they can be external. For example, if I, can change inform if I can exchange information or collaborate with a business partner, with a supplier, and the information that I provide to the supplier will permit the supplier to better estimate how much of a particular resource I'm going to be needing, then the supplier can guarantee a particular service level. This can also allow for the acquisition of products at a lower price, given that a better estimate of consumption is obtained from, from these projections. This communication improvement then translates to lower prices and it's moved to the customer, which then creates a competitive advantage. Part of the, part of the success of Walmart has been this. I mentioned before that they're great at, 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 at evaluating knowledge, at evaluating data and creating new knowledge. Well, they're also masters of supply chain. They have... Of, they have strategies in place with their with their suppliers that allow them to really project sales and they can they can pretty much project exactly how much they'll need of a, of a particular product at a particular time by doing this they can optimize the supply chain to always have the exact product at, at, the, at the exact time and guarantee volume this in turn reduces the cost of a product and is passed directly to the to the end user which ultimately gives them a competitive advantage even though even though a lot of organizations have been able to analyze what Walmart does very few have been able to copy it another example for example is is Dell Dell computers were, was once known as masters of having just in time inventory and part of their strategy was forcing their suppliers to, con to develop and construct warehouses and distribution centers within one mile of Dell's uh, distribution center. What this would, would allow is less time between, uh, between product acquisition, between uh, delivery, and it created a, a, logistics, a logistics advantage over their competition. Now, even though uh, other competitors knew what Dell was doing, it was very difficult to replicate because just because you know how somebody does something does not guarantee that you'll be able to copy it. And so that provides a competitive advantage. Now these will eventually be short-lived because at some point in time somebody will be able to figure it out and they have. And Dell has essentially lost the competitive advantage that they once had. Well, this is the end of, of uh, this section. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Have a great day.